in the problems we have, that women explicitly voted us into an unsustainable welfare state, do our problems ultimately stem from female suffrage? And is there any basis to the increasingly common argument I hear that to solve our societal problems, the right to vote should be stripped from women? There are basically two main premises behind this argument. First, the correlation that women got the vote sometime before the growth of the welfare state. And secondly, that women tend to vote left, that being the Democrats in the case of the US. To start with, I've never found this post hoc ergo propter hoc explanation for, you know, female suffrage causing the welfare state particularly compelling. There is quite a gap between women getting the vote and the rather quick growth of the welfare state. It would be just as likely to say that motor cars caused the welfare state because they came first. If you ask me, it's much more directly explained by more immediate non-political changes. Introduction of the pill. Pill leads to sexual revolution. Sexual revolution plus contraceptive failure leads to single motherhood. And whether it comes from the husband or the state, raising children requires financial backing. As such, we see government welfare follow the growth of single mothers. Now we get to the second issue. Whether or not you personally think that single mothers should receive welfare is wholly irrelevant to the issue of whether it was female suffrage that actually caused these problems in the first place. Because under the two-party preferred system that operates in most of the West, it is not the prerogative of either wing of politics, left-wing feminists or right-wing conservatives, to start throwing mothers and their children out into the street. Once birth control and the sexual revolution has rained down a single motherhood epidemic, it's already too late. It's not democratically voted policy, it's disaster control. This may seem like somewhat of a hyperbolic example, but the choice basically comes down to either paying the shortfall in living costs to single mothers or letting the country deteriorate into Calcutta, India, where a third of the population squats in slums. And believe me, it would be that bad. Across most major Western countries today, 25% of households are headed by a single parent. The reality of turning off that welfare tap could mean as much as 25% of the population are effectively made homeless. Taxpayer-funded welfare is not ideal, but the other side of that decision is economic disaster and skyrocketing crime rates. This is a reality that the government doesn't want to deal with, regardless of who's in office. You know, you might be an anarcho-capitalist who just gets a raging hard-on for the end of Atlas Shrugged, where the lights are going out across the city, but the fact is that you are in the minority, and neither major party or political wing actually wants to see this collapse fantasy become a reality. In other words... The fact that women show a marginal preference to vote Democrat doesn't seem to make jack shit difference to the actual running of the welfare state. I mean, assuming women en masse were to actively vote against their own identitarian interests because they were suddenly struck with some irrational need to try and reduce the welfare state that they don't even pay for, exactly which major party would they vote for? The only administration that seems to have had a significant effect on welfare was Reagan, and even that comes with a couple of very important caveats. The first being that the welfare reforms under the Reagan administration did not reduce welfare spending. It slowed it down significantly, but there was still a marginal net growth under his tenure. Secondly, Whatever the impact that the Republican Reagan administration had on the welfare state seems to have been immediately undone by the following Republican Bush administration. So much so that if we draw a projected line along the graph, by the end of Bush's presidency, welfare spending is right back where we'd expect, as if the Reagan years were a mere figment of imagination. Further to that, despite welfare reforms, Reagan still didn't balance the federal budget. Overall spending and debt as a percentage of GDP went up under both Reagan and Bush administrations. 
I know this doesn't mesh well with what a lot of the small government Republican advocates in this community want to believe, but based on these numbers, they were in fact worse than the following Democratic Clinton administration. Now, there is certainly a difference in election year rhetoric between the two political parties. The Democrats say they are much more in favour of social justice and welfare, whereas the Republicans say they are much more in favour of individual responsibility. Obviously, women will show a preference for the former, particularly single women with marital status being the key determining factor as to whether a woman voted for Obama in the last election. However, when the election is over and it comes to the practical running of the nation, we really don't see a significant difference in the welfare numbers under either administration. Ultimately, women could vote 100% Republican and the Tradcons would still give them the welfare. In fact, I can quite easily imagine a scenario where women didn't get the right to vote at all, but the development of the birth control pill and a subsequent sexual revolution still leads us to the single motherhood epidemic and the welfare state that we have today. You see, all of this talk about welfare budgets and female voting preferences is kind of secondary. The most important piece in this whole puzzle about female political power is one that everyone here is already acutely aware of, but for some baffling reason conveniently forgets whenever there is a satisfying finger of blame to point. And that is the fact that the original women, infant and children welfare policy was implemented long, long before women ever got the right to vote. I refer, of course, to the Tender Years Doctrine. This whole position about women voting us into an unsustainable welfare state completely overlooks the fact that women were already getting what they politically wanted from male politicians long before they ever got the right to vote themselves. Hell, when women finally wanted the vote themselves, comfortable with the knowledge that they wouldn't be similarly subject to the draft that voting men were, male politicians acquiesced and gave them that too. I think what the Tender Years Doctrine really begins to unveil here is that political suffrage, that is the ability to vote, and political enfranchisement, the ability to affect actual change, are two fundamentally different things. You see, what everyone overlooked on the, you know, female suffrage cause my problems bandwagon is that female political power ultimately didn't come from the vote. It preceded it. And I think the depth of this fundamental disconnect between suffrage and enfranchisement crystallizes with perfect clarity when we compare the political interests of women to another concurrent political struggle happening at the same time. <laughs>